Good afternoon. My name is Roderick Miller. I'm the chairman of tracingthepast.org, a nonprofit organization located in Berlin, Germany. The topic of today's TEDx is brave new space, and the space that I have in mind is the everyday living environment of today's Europeans, specifically addressing in what ways the Holocaust adage, never forget, relates to, or could relate to, our contemporary sense of space. With the last few remaining eyewitnesses of the Shoah now passing on, is it possible to never forget something that we never personally experienced? Babies are usually, by the age of about five months, able to focus on distant three-dimensional objects. But what do they see? With no concept of a cat or a house or a tree, probably just an abstract jumble of shapes and color. This is most likely has some effect, anyway, on why we have no memory of when we were infants. It's only later, when we evolve the conceptual constructs necessary for the development of memory, as an adult, you tend to notice things because they're new, unusual, or stand out in some way. But what makes you remember or never forget them? Without getting too much into the very complicated neurosciences of it, I think that we can at least agree that memory is formed both from experience, things that happen to us externally, and things that we read about, learn about, in short, our education. On the one hand, you recognize this restaurant because that's where you met your girlfriend. On the other hand, you recognize this house because Beethoven lived there. Now, you didn't actually see Beethoven there, but perhaps you're a classical music fan and you saw a picture in a book of Beethoven's house, and when you saw the actual house, that triggered your memory. Learning things creates memories the same way that experiencing external stimuli creates memories. And furthermore, the memories you have about places alter your perceptions of those places. These things are so basic that we tend to take them for granted. To illustrate my point, 76 years ago, in this wonderful theater, the Volkstheater here in Vienna, a man stood on this stage and exhorted his enthusiastic audience to give three hail victories to the leader who was across the way watching his favorite opera. That man was the Nazi leader of Vienna, and he went on to implement the extermination camps of Majdanek, Treblinka, Sobibor, and Bugetz. I would hope that you're now knowing that this beautiful theater once hosted a man responsible for the deaths of two million human beings would have some effect on your perception of this space today. But then again, what does the Holocaust have to do with us, anyway? I first moved to Berlin about 10 years ago, after an absence of nearly 20 years. I had missed the entire period when the Berlin Wall came down, and I think that my perception of space was particularly sensitized by the unusual way that Berlin had changed. Um, I noticed on my street these small brass plaques memorializing victims of the Nazis called Stolpersteine, or stumbling stones. And I became curious, did anybody live in my house? I presumed that this data would be easily available and quite easy to find out, but then was quite disappointed. As it turns out, if, if one of these people lived in your house in Berlin, the chances are only about 1% that there will be a Stolperstein for this person in front of your house. For the other 99% of the places where the victims of the Nazis lived in Berlin, the only place I could find to look was the Berlin Memorial Book. So I got a copy of this book. It's like this, 50,000 names, 1,500 pages, alphabetized by last name. 
and started looking through there, trying to find my home address. And after several hours of uh, feeling like I'm going to go blind soon, I, <laughs> it's like the heaviest telephone book ever, um, I decided, this is ridiculous. It's going to be much easier just to digitize this. So I had it scanned, text recognition software, and imported the data into a database software. The first time that I alphabetized this data by street instead of last name, it was like one of these eureka cartoon moments where, where the light bulb goes on above the guy's head. It, because I realized that these people, instead of being scattered over a dozen pages of a memorial book, became grouped together by relationship, by family structures. That came to the forefront. Here you see a listing for Metzerstrasse in berlin Prenzlauer Berg. Metzerstrasse 19, five people named Kompart. Here you see Louis and Olga Kompart, an elderly couple who in September of 1942 were deported to Theresienstadt ghetto. One month later, in October of 1942, their son, Friedrich Karl, and his wife, Ruth, born Stadthagen, committed suicide together, leaving behind their infant child, Uri Kompart. By looking at the deportation lists, I was able to determine that the Uri, uh, Uri Kompart, the orphan, was, together with his grandparents, Solomon and Benvenida Stadthagen, deported eight months later to Theresienstadt ghetto and then to Auschwitz. By creatively rearranging this cold data, it's possible to extract a narrative continuity, a living story from the lifeless lists of a standard memorial book. Enough, this is Berlin. Let's come back to Vienna. Maybe go out of the theater a little bit here. When you leave the theater and take a left in Neustiftgasse and walk down six or eight blocks, at the light, take a left at Neubaugasse, you go a about a block or so, and there's a large yellow 70 number sticking out of the side of a building, and that's Neubaugasse 70. In this house, the businessman Ferdinand Huppert lived with his family in apartment number 13 where he ran in the ground floor a shop for radios. He died in early 1941 and was buried in the central Vienna cemetery um, due to a lack of medical care. And it turns out that the sole reason that he died of this was because of the fact that he happened to be Jewish. His wife, or widow, I should say, several months later, was arrested and brought to the collection point to prepare for deportation at the school in Kleine Sperlgasse II, which you see here in the photograph. Irma wrote letters to her children while she was imprisoned there. Her daughter got a hold of the letters after the war because somebody had managed to smuggle them out. Her daughter has saved herself by emigrating to the United States at the last moment. In retrospect, it's very difficult to read these letters because Irma writes how she is going to write to her children when she arrives at the unknown destination in the East, when, in fact, along with 1,000 other people on the transport to the Minsk ghetto, she was, upon arrival, herded into a ditch and shot. Their son, Leopold Huppert, managed to escape to Belgium, but after the Nazis invaded, he was imprisoned and interned in the south of France, from where he also escaped. By March 1944, he was living in Rue Le Serre in Paris, which is here in the photograph, but was denounced, arrested, and deported from Drancy Transit Camp to Auschwitz. He was not gassed upon arrival, however, because of his electronic skills and the fact that he was in good health, so he was forced to, make, to do forced labor in the camp. As the Red Army approached Auschwitz, he and his fellow prisoners were moved and marched into further camps in the Reich, including Mauthausen here in Austria, 
middle Baldora, where the prisoners were forced to build V-2 rockets for the Nazis, and he was last recorded alive in March 1945 in Grudnitz, a subcamp of Flossenburg concentration camp. Leopold Huppert did not live the remaining eight weeks of the war. He was 32 years old. So, last month, in preparation for TEDx Vienna, I thought I would look in the uh, Austrian Documentation Center and see if I could find any people that lived in this neighborhood, in the 7th District, and came across Irma Huppert and her son, Leopold Huppert. So I did some further uh, research online uh, in my own databases, and by the time I was done, Irma had a maiden name, Schlesinger, and Leopold had emigrated to Belgium and landed in the camp in which he probably died. Because you see, this essential basic information was missing from the official Austrian government source. Ferdinand appeared as well, because he wasn't in the source at all, and actually only appeared because his daughter left a testimonial for him at the Israeli memorial site Yad Vashem. Now, it's very easy to be judgmental about things that you don't completely understand, very complicated issues. I do know that historians and archivists working at government institutions are very good, very competent people, but I know, too, that these institutions are largely understaffed and underfunded. It's taken many of these governmental institutions 70 years to sort of get it half right. There's also a number of countries that openly collaborated with the Nazis that have not even begun to properly shed light on this dark chapter of their own histories. For our own part, our organization, TracingThePast.org, has just released a database of the German minority census of 1939, listing the residential addresses of 280,000 Germans of Jewish descent, probably the largest publicly available Holocaust-related database searchable by street address, and including about 80% of the German Holocaust victims. We hope that this proves useful to family researchers and historians, and in its own way, it is groundbreaking. However, it's intended on our part more as a gesture to show a fraction of the data that we have available to us, and more importantly, our intent to pursue our goals for memorialization. Starting with a few towns in Germany, Austria, and Western Poland, and spreading throughout Europe, our goal is to make it possible to find the stories of these people where they once actually lived. Here is a map on tracingthepast.org of the 7th District here in Vienna, where you can now look uh, as a sample and see each of the people marked by pins and each of the pins linked to a biography. Connected to the biography is also a photograph of where they once lived. or via Street View, if it's available in the area, or as an app on your smartphone linked to GPS coordinates of the street that you're walking down, or in a more traditional manner, searchable by name, location, or a combination of these, to arrive at a biography, to which anybody can contribute via crowdsourcing with text, pictures, contemporary witness videos or sound recordings, accessible on your home computer or, as I mentioned, as an app on your smartphone with Street View linked GPS coordinates. Our goal is for you to be able to walk down any street in Europe and learn the Holocaust history of that specific place. The Nazis lost the war but in one way they were successful with the Holocaust in the sense that the identity of individual Shoah victims has been largely erased from memory in the places where they lived. I believe that restoring their memory to those places can bring back an awareness of their individual identities back into the living space of contemporary Europeans.
By getting middle school and high school kids involved in the history of the place they live, they'll hopefully be less likely to be attracted to the racist and xenophobic tendencies of extreme right-wing nationalistic politics spreading in Europe today. This is not just about never forget, this is also about never again. 100 years from now, probably everything that can be known about the Holocaust will be known. But this collection, assimilation, and publication of scattered data is not just possible, it's inevitable. By passing these millions of stories into the lives of people today, we can keep the memory of these people alive, many of whom had no physical memorial, no grave, a grave in the air, as the poet Paul Ceylon once wrote, leaving nothing behind but the printed word of their name and the facts of their brutal deaths. Reviving memories in places they once called home is, to my mind, like a kind of caddish, a prayer for the dead, for people, many of whom had no one left to do so for them. Millions of people had their homes and their lives taken from them by the German-Austrian Nazis, their military, and their willing allies, and those lives can never be restored. But we, together, by working together on the grassroots level in our neighborhoods and on the international level on the internet, we can and we will give their names and their memories back a home. Thank you.